and welcome to the Onyx Strategies Group blog. I am joined today by Brian Joyner, Deputy Superintendent of Rock Creek Park National Park here in Washington, D.C. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Rock Creek Park, it is a wonderful forest in the middle of the city. So for us, of for, for many of us who live here, it is a local park, but it also has that national designation, and we are so happy to have it. I also want to say that uh, Brian is our third guest of four that we are featuring here on the Onyx Strategies Group video blog for Black History Month regarding conservation and preservation. So I can't wait to get into Brian's story. So Brian, welcome. Thank you for being here. Crystal, thank you so much for inviting me. This is going to be a good time. Yes, it's my pleasure. It really is. So tell us how and why you went into conservation, let alone landing in the National Park Service. So you guys can see him. He's got on his green. And, uh, you know, we want to hear about this. So um, this is actually a much more common story than I thought, but I am <laughs> an accidental park employee. So um, I was a history major at University of Maryland. I was doing some work with the Historical Society of Washington, D.C., and I had always wanted to do something with, uh, with history and writing and was trying to figure out what that, how that might happen. Um, and I had, had, I had worked in other fields and done some other things um, by the time I came to the Historical Society. And as I was starting to formulate this idea that, hey, this is really what I want to do, um, I was talking to a couple of people I knew, and they all sent me on these informational interviews. And one of them was with a guy who was working for the National Park Service um, in the Cultural Resources Directorate. So one, I did not realize that the Park Service had a Cultural Resources Directorate at the time when I went to this interview. So, um, you know, I'm going in and, you know, I'm meeting this guy and we're sitting there chatting a little bit and then we go grab some coffee. And then he says, you know, on the QT, um, I just took a job with the Maryland State Historic Preservation Office. Um, don't know when I'm going to be starting, but this job's going to be available. And it was a writer editor position. So it wasn't a historian position, but it was a writer editor position hmm. working for um, a group that was no, at the time called the Special Project, Diversity and Special Projects Office. So he's like, so this job's going to be available. And I actually think you, you would be kind of good for this. So when we go back upstairs, I'm going to introduce you to my boss. So Method's boss, I talked to her for about maybe five minutes. Um, Antoinette Lee is her name. She is retired now from the Park Service, but um, worked for the Park Service, worked for the, um, the Trust for Historic Preservation previously. Um, she's um, she is a George Washington University uh, PhD graduate. Um, Tony was a, an incredible mentor, an incredible individual. She talked to me, for, like, like I said, for about five minutes, and I was like, I don't know that I made that great an impression. But fast forward about 30 days, I get a phone call. Hey, it's Tony Lee. You remember you met me? I was like, yes, ma'am. I definitely remember. <laughs> well, the gentleman who I was talking about, Scott, Scott Whipple, Scott's gone to work for the Maryland Shippo. Um, would you be interested in coming in for an interview for this position? So that ultimately led to me coming in as a contractor. I was contracted for about two years, and then I got hired as a federal employee working with um, the special diver uh, diversity and special um, projects office, which eventually became known as the Cultural Resources Diversity Program. And so how did this budding writing career turn into a deputy superintendent job? Because, you know, a big part of your, your work is, I mean, you've mm -hmm. got a forest to manage. Sure. <laughs> so how, what, how do you go from writing to managing forests? So you know you made the you made the uh, you made the connection uh, at the beginning of this preservation and conservation. So my background right, professionally is in historic preservation. So the work I was doing when I came into the Park Service as writer, editor, and researcher was around historic preservation. So I mentioned Tony, and I mentioned Tony for this uh, for many reasons. But one of them was she was was the person who said. Look, here's what you need to know to be able to do this job effectively. So 
I took uh, graduate classes at um, George Washington University. I had a lot of informal um, mentoring from different individuals. I learned about the different cultural resources uh, documentation programs that existed within the National Park Service. Um, I could tick off a bunch of acronyms and names and some of them people, people would be familiar with. But the bigger piece of this is like, hey, we document and we memorialize what it is we care about. That's was the message that came to me um, as um, I was learned, starting to learn about what historic preservation is, what the Historic Preservation Act of 1966 does and doesn't do. When people start talking about what is Section 106, these compliance issues, what is that? What is Section 110? Yeah. Was the federal response with federal agencies responsibility in historic preservation? All these things are coming at me. And what it ultimately said was the things we document and the things that we preserve are the things that we value. So I spent about 10 years working in cultural resources. So with the um, cultural resources diversity program. As a writer editor, I was editor for a newsletter, Heritage Matters, that ran for about 10 years. Um, I uh, wrote three different books, um, the Reflection of the American Landscape series. And it looked, it looks at the impacts of diverse communities on the built environment. So one was looking specifically at West African culture. I'd mentioned before that um, the gentleman who uh, had previously had the job was working, uh, working on a couple of projects this conference on Africanisms was that project. So out of that conference, we decided that we were going to, as opposed to say, hey, we're gonna do this same time again next year. Um, it's like, what can we take the lessons that we learned from all these incredible papers? We have scholars from all over the world um, talking about the built environment, talking about the impacts of West African culture. Can we take all that and distill it into a document that Crystal's family owns a sugar plantation, <clears throat> you know, and now they're trying to like do some documentation on it. They're trying to figure out the history of it. And they want some, they need more information. Well, I mentioned the documentation programs for the, history, for the National Park Service. So there's the National Register of Historic Places, the, the Historic American Building Survey, all these different programs basically have documented aspects, these various aspects of American history. So we, in the book, we say, hey, here are the different places you can go find some of this. Here are examples. Here are examples that the Park Service didn't actually identify as being related to African American or West African history. But when you, be, when you look into the scholarship, you can really get to this. You can see this. It's like, oh, they're not talking about it here. It got listed because it's a plantation. But then when you talk about sugar production, well, you know, the means of sugar production have roots in Western North, uh, Western North Africa, as well as Asia. Then you start having that conversation. Suddenly, this becomes a much more robust, it's, it's, history is layered, right? Um, you know, the, the documentation programs, because, you know, you have to start in somewhere, you know, look at things like periods of significance. They look at, you know, um, they look at integrity. So they look at very mm -hmm. specific and quantifiable things. But when you start stacking those up, you get to this much more rich tapestry. So um it was so it was really I I got I got fortunate. I mean, all of this is to say I was really <laughs> fortunate and got the benefit of some incredible mentors. So 10 years. I worked, I, I did the writing, so we wrote the three books, one looking at West African history, one looking at Asian history, Pan-Asian history, and one looking at Hispanic history. Um, so did the three books, um, did the journal, um, did the um, newsletter, worked on a bunch of other projects. And then after about 10 years, um, it dawned on me that you know, I hadn't, you know, left my cubicle, right? You know, I mean, got to go to conferences and do stuff like right, that. But, right, right. <laughs> but, my, but my career was kind of confined by, you know, my cubicle, my laptop, and, work, and the documents I was working on. And that wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, we all need to grow, right? Right. So exactly. about the same time, I was fortunate enough to meet one of our deputy directors for the Park Service. And he needed a management assistant. So he asked me to come on and do a detail um, as his management assistant. 
So um, that individual's name is Mickey Fern. Um, Mickey is now retired. He had been, yes. after the Park Service, he was at uh, North Carolina State University um, as a professor of practice there. Um, Mickey has been in the, in the space around conservation and equity as it relates to people of color and talking about where those, where those things meet and where they diverge and how we can do a better job of talking about them. Um, and keeping them in, um, interlinked. So I worked for Mickey for a couple of years, and that was a that was a world opening experience. So mm -hmm. I went from you know just really trying to become you know proficient at understanding historic preservation to now like having to figure out oh yeah this is the rest of the Park Service. So you know the mm -hmm. documentation programs and all that stuff you know. All those programs take up maybe 40% of what the Park Service does, but then there's the other 60%. You know, yes. and most people's perception is like in the woods, you yes. know, at a river, you know, yes. at a scenic overlook, those sorts of things. And I hadn't spent a lot of time in those spaces, but working for him, I got that opportunity. This is wonderful. And so your perspective is very different from the other three gentlemen because they're in the private sector and you're at a federal agency. And mm -hmm. so from your perch, what kind of limitations do you have that they may not have? Or do you actually have more access to help for interventions than they might have? So I'm um, a little curious about what that federal role looks like versus, you know, some of the nonprofits and some mm -hmm. of your colleagues in this space, you know, have to work with. So. I'd say my limitations ha have changed, um, mm. and what, and and this is why. So, I just described to you ten plus years working basically at headquarters, right? Right. Um, right. And what be what I became aware of during, particularly during that time when I was working with um, Deputy Director Fern, um, was that. I needed to be closer to where the work, the work of the park service actually where the rubber met the road. Yes. And that's being in a park or being in parks. Um, and I will be honest, I had never had a, a, a day's inkling of wanting to go be a ranger um, prior to that. So, but I recognize like, okay, if you really want to like, we had identified all these best practices. We had looked at all this historic context for all these different aspects of mm -hmm. you know, the breadth of American society. But if you want that to actually hit, be impactful, it, you need to be where people are, right? Yes. Where the people who yes. you're who you're trying to impact with this and influence with. It. So that's what led me to actually go work to start to making a career change. So at that point. I wound up doing, um, I did a fellowship where I worked on Capitol Hill for a year as a, as a uh, staffer for the Natural Resources Committee on, on the House side. Um, did that, came back, worked in our Legislative Affairs Office, and then and when that was done, that two-year stint was done, I started applying for jobs in the parks. So I wound up working at the National Mall. So you get to the National Mall, I get to the National Mall, and it's not exactly like most other power. Parks. No, it's but, not. It's a, it's a microcosm and a macro. Yeah. Sure. But you've got these monuments and memorials, and there are all these conversations that are taking place out here in the greater society about how do we how do we can how do we maintain it or continue or change the interpretation around them, right? So I cannot change the history curriculum for the national for the United States. I can working in a park say, in these spaces, we are going to start talking about these things. Absolutely. You know, you know as Absolutely. part of leadership for the park, you know, we advocated for, you know, hey, you know, we've done the historic preservation. We know, you know, we've got the documentation on these things. We know these stories. Now there are these other stories, part of history that may not be related directly to say the Lincoln Memorial, but they're, li or they're linked to Lincoln, that time frame, the reason why this memorial is significant, its impact upon community, uh, the community of Washington, D.C., its broader impact on the United States. Yeah. We can speak to that. We can make, you know, 
our, you know, the parks, you know, interpretive team was really starting to move towards, hey, we need to be able to, we need to be able to link Lincoln to MLK to Washington, like all the, like the, the, these resources are here and they're in conversation with each other. We just need to make sure we are translating that conversation for the public because the public sees the obelisk, they see the Parthenon's type building, they see the statues, but they don't understand that these things are, are literally in conversation with each other. That's wonderful. And, and, and as you talk about how important interpretation is, I know that the National Park Service has struggled with that over the years. And so we know very well that diversity, equity, and inclusion has been somewhat difficult for the agency. And, you know, there was Bob Stanton, the first sure. Black male director. And now we've got Chuck Sams, which is refreshing mm -hmm. because he's the first Native American director, mm -hmm. which is way overdue. But are you seeing an increase in the number, the increase in the number of Black men in leadership at the National Park Service? And are you really beginning to see a sea change in the way these stories are told? So I think the sea change in the way the stories are told is happening. Okay. Um, so you know, I am now old. I am now old enough to have a at least one, if not two, generations underneath. <laughs> yeah. Don't even. I know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> in, 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 I'm having a problem admitting that, but yes, yeah. you're right. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and and I've been in conversations with people where that like. I remember when Rally on the High Ground, the whole conversation, the the whole look at changing the discussion around the Civil War became, you know, a focal point. You know, Jesse Jackson mm. Jr. was the representative in, from Illinois at the time, um, really pushing for this, um, amongst others. Um, and I remember how uncomfortable many of our folks, in particular folks who work at, you know, what we like to call cannonball parks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the Civil War parks. Because the people who come to those parks invariably had come because they wanted to talk about military battles. They wanted to, they were reenactors. That's why they were there. They weren't necessarily, necessarily there to have the conversation about why the war was being fought. And given the history of how we taught, <laughs> you know, the Civil War, it wasn't exactly like we were looking, looking at this through a diversity and equity lens. So this conversation, Rally on the High Ground, really kind of starts kicking people in the butt around, hey, you're going to have to tell people why we are, why, why anyone even cares about this, right? This, that, like, this just didn't happen because, you know, people were having a bad day. You know, we got to really talk about that. And from that moment, so that's 2002, 2003, moving forward, you know, I, you know, I have, you know, I occasionally go out and take tours um, at different places mm -hmm. and I don't wear my uniform. I don't necessarily. On relate. purpose. Yeah. And I don't necessarily yeah. relate to people who that who I am and why I'm there. Um, and the number of people who and the number of people are rangers and how we've trained rangers to do interpretation, you know, audience centered interpretation, uh, all those sorts of things um, really has led to this younger group of interpreters who are like, we can, yeah, we can talk about this. We, we can absolutely talk about this and not be uncomfortable with it, right? You know, ha and have the skills to be able to talk about and deal with the difficult conversations. And, you know, the last three years here in the greater Washington, D.C. area have been somewhat challenging around that. You know, you have people who come here and all they want to do is they just want, they want to come and see the memorials, they want to come and see the monuments, they want to have that rah-rah, really patriotic conversation and moment, and that's what they're interested in. And then someone starts talking about, well, how did these buildings get built? <laughs> and what did you know, do you know what used to be there where that marker is? That's right. And all of a sudden, you know, it's just like, that is that was not necessarily the discussion they wanted to have. But our rangers are ready to have those conversations. They have been trained to have those. So that's a that's a sea change. And as we make changes to our interpretive materials, our websites, mm -hmm. as the books I mentioned are three of multiple publications that have come out that Parship has put out, um, 
you know, historic theme studies that have been done looking at a much broader range of diversity in park service um, and in park service resources, talking about things like, you know, Japanese internment, um, you know, addressing, you know, addressing trail of tears, and, you know, looking into some of these really, really, really pivotal moments that, you know, have long-term repercussions for the American story that we somehow or another haven't really gotten hold of and used as part of our regular history curriculum. So many people within the Park Service, and I think a lot of people without outside the Park Service do believe that part of our role as an agency is to tell that fuller story, regardless of what's happening in our classes. Regardless of what, you know, the debates that are happening in other places about this is like, no, 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 no. We have this. Dwight Pacately used to be the chief historian. Um, we talk on a regular basis about the thousand. Uh, the number I'm going to say is 8,000. That may not be accurate. Someone can check me on this. Feel okay. free to send me an email. But <laughs> 8,000 pages of congressional testimony from the early 1800s to 1860 about the topic of slavery, about the about what we are going to do about it, the debate back and forth, uh, you know, the three fifths compromise, the you know, ending of the slave trade, the then questions about it, like, well, are we going to allow slavery to expand in all these other places? So it takes away when you when you when you bring that sort of scholarship to the table. Mm -hmm. And when you can when you, you can have the historians and the PhDs and the archaeologists and anthropologists and all those people bring that work and then have the interpreters be able to in the ways that they can skillfully relay that to people, you have an opportunity to really kind of change the dynamic around how we talk about these things and how we engage in this. And the other question you asked was, am I seeing an increase of Black men in the organization? I will say that- In leadership. In leadership. What I would say is that there is a serious push towards that. Mm -hmm. It has not always yielded the results that I would like. And people like my buddy, George McDonald um, and others would love to see the, you know, you know, those of us who've been around now long enough to, you know, Buy, in, buy into and, you know, support multiple efforts around this yeah. and, you know, feel like, feel like there may be a tipping point, mm. um, but we haven't quite seen, we haven't seen it yet. I mean, we've seen changes in other places, like the number of women in leadership, huge. Very um, true. Absolutely. Um, the fact that the lead historian for the National Park Service, Chikai Lowe's, an African-American woman, one of my favorite people in the organization. Mm -hmm. Let's not take that away. We And we do have African-American superintendents, deputy superintendents um, in, our, in our different programs, cultural resource programs, conservation programs. Um, but I don't, but I don't know that we've hit, I don't know that we've reached what we've what we've been trying to get to as of yet. Um, but you know, change change is slow, but it is coming. Amen, sir. Well <laughs> said. And I want to I I so want to flip the script, but I I know that we don't have a, a lot of time. But I want to have you back because I would love to really talk about philanthropy in terms of the sustainability of these sites. So when you talk about telling those stories and you talk about um, really preserving these artifacts with regards to parks of color, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of philanthropy available that's supporting that like you have with you know, the Lincoln Memorials or the Jefferson mm -hmm. Memorials and et cetera. So mm -hmm. I really want to have that conversation with you, but we're not going to have it today. So that is something that folks are going to just have to um, wait on. And But we are sure. going to have that conversation. But um, I really appreciate your insight uh, with regard to where the storytelling has come. And mm -hmm. so 
where you sit right now, what has been the most rewarding aspect in this role as deputy superintendent? And then what's also been your biggest lesson learned? Sure. So the most rewarding aspect in my current role, had a conversation today, I kid you not. Um, a friends group who was interested in, you know, engineering and 18th, 18th and 19th century technology. We have, you, you may be aware that we have Pierce Mill, it's a water mill, sits down there, so it's 100, 150, 160 years old, maybe mm -hmm. closer, to, closer to 200 years old, I'll take that back. Um, but a conversation came up today around an African-American individual who had been part of the Pierce complex. So formerly enslaved, gets, you know, is emancipated, but then is valued, his 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 work um is valued and he's brought back on by the Pierce family. And now there's a question about whether or not he was actually related to the Pierces and things of that nature. Mm. And like, they were excited to have this conversation and like, oh, this could be- Change. Yeah, this could be a really interesting, robust piece of, you know, scholarship that we bring to four. Now in the park has been, Rock Creek has been working, you know, diligently on starting to tell some of the, uh, tell more of the stories of, you know, we, you talked about Rock Creek as being a force in the, in the middle of the city, but there were people lived there. You know, there were homes. Um, there were homes, and some of those homes were owned by African Americans. Yeah. And you know, so we there's some archaeological space of places that you know have the re remnants of those places that we can tell. We can tell those stories, and we're trying. We're starting to do more in telling those stories. And we actually had a group of kids um, from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, they the way that that school works in their junior year, those kids have to go and do an externship somewhere. Um, and Washington used to be their primary location. Now they go all over the world, but Washington is still one of their, their premier locations. Uh, and we had a group of those kids who came and scoured um, records in the archives and genealogical records and all these other things to try to get more information specifically about the formerly enslaved African Americans who lived over in Reno City, which is over Fort Reno, open near Tenley Town. So Reno City was a mixed race community after the Civil War that was there and established and, you know, upwardly it was, it was a upwardly mobile um, community. And then there was a huge push in the late 1800s or the 1900s to remove African Americans from that section of Northwest Washington, D.C. And as a result, Reno City wound up going the way of, you know, progress as it were. They spent all summer really kind of going through the different records and trying to, they had a list of names, but trying to not only confirm the names, but identify where they moved when they left Reno City. Do they still have family here? How do we tell more of their stories? Wow. You know, so this, you know, the, the earlier story in this particular one really kind of point to the amount of work that's being done on the cultural side mm. in this park. You know, people think about it being, you know, this natural space, but in all natural spaces, there's culture, there's, cult there's, cu there's cultural resources, and there's this cultural conversation. So, um, and I think the biggest lesson learned um, in my current position is, is that you don't get to choose when you engage. Mm. So if, if in a perfect world, I would be able to carve out space to say, I'm going to be working on these things and then we're going to shift our gaze over here and we're gonna work on these things. Now that anyone who's had a job knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And then, there's this sort of job working at a park, a park in an urban area with 99 reservations over 3,000 acres in the city of Washington, D.C. And the sorts of things that show up on my doorstep, literally, 
um, on a day-to-day basis that all of them deserve my undivided attention. Mm, okay. And where where I am now as a leader in this space is that one, as much as I would love to just go do the history stuff and hang out in that in that in that world and go talk to my cultural resources folks and go down and you know yeah let's 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 go check out some archaeological sites <laughs> you know let's, let's let's go do some oral histories I don't get to do that anymore <laughs> yeah I don't get to do that anymore and what I recognize is but just because I don't get to do that anymore doesn't mean it shouldn't it shouldn't resonate as mm. much with other people. Like I need to be able to like make sure that they understand, go, go do this work. I want to read it when I get some time. And then we're going to have to talk about baseball over Fort Reno because <laughs> <you know, laughs> baseball season's coming. We got to get the fence up. We got to go, we got, we go do that. Um, so it's under, it's like appreciating that, it's appreciating that the number of things here that can occupy my time are endless. And what I have to be able to do is recognize all the stuff I would like to do. I'm not going to be able to get to. I just need to identify who can. And so I want our listeners to understand that what Brian also hasn't said is that he and the superintendent also have to deal with all the maintenance that goes on in that park. So you, we're mm-hmm. talking about all the great stuff, like, you know, the stories, but we're not talking about the nitty gritty where, you know, the sidewalks come up or mm-hmm. uh, a, a water uh, pipe bursts or something like that. So those mm-hmm. are all the things that you have to deal with in an urban environment and in a national park. And um, that's not easy because uh, I've seen you all have to do those things and it's not mm-hmm. enviable. But <laughs> Uh, final question, uh, Brian. Sure. So this has been so wonderful. And thank you for um, having, thank you for coming on and having a revealing conversation with us about, you know, what you do and the mm-hmm. National Park Service. And so with that said, what is your biggest inspiration in the work? Is it a person, place, or thing? Um, it's always the people. It's always the people. the people. Yeah, I mean, any given day of the week, I you know, I can walk out of my office over to Klingle, um, Klingle Mansion, uh, which is on Linnean Hill, which is a high spot in this, one of the high spots in the city. And Beautiful. I can walk, yeah, and I can walk down one of the trails and there are folks, you know, getting in their 10,000 steps during the lunch, during the lunch hour. Uh, there are, you know, parents with their kids and strollers trying to teach them how to catch um there are people who just found out that there's a fish ladder over near um pierce mill and want to know why these fish are trying to swim upstream they don't do that here that's like a salmon thing it's like well (laughs) you know and every day those people come to this park and find something to be amazed and and awed by um, my oldest daughter um, shared a poem today um, about Rock Creek Park. It was, I'm trying to remember the name of the poem. Um, it, um, but it was Conversation with Rock Creek Park. Um, and it literally was this woman engaging with the various aspects of the park and how it spoke to her. And despite all the other stuff in the world, the park held her and was or it was able to, it, it, being in conversation with the park meant, was able to, gave her, gave her solace, gave her strength. And also more importantly, kept, kept reminding her about what was most important. So the fact that people come to this park and find those sorts of things like, be it recre- be it all types of recreation, right? You right. know, give it, you know, you we can define recreation how you want, but it's the people who come here and it's because they come here, it gives the park meaning. You know, I know, I know a lot of folks who do this work, who work in parks and work in, you know, cult- cultural and natural spaces, are always concerned that people are going to overrun the resources, right? 
But if the people don't come, the resources have no significance. They don't mean anything. What a beautiful way to conclude our conversation and shout out and love to your daughter for just a wonderful and just heartfelt poem. Is that what she wrote? She wrote a poem? It wasn't a poem that she wrote, but it was a poem that she, she had to pick out a poem that she had to, she was going to have to go through and annotate. And that was the poem she chose. Well, it was well chosen, well said. (laughs) And I can't thank you enough for spending some time with me today, Brian. I so appreciate it. And I so appreciate you. And I hope that you're going to be willing to come back on and speak to me about um, philanthropy and the parks. Absolutely, Crystal. I appreciate you asking me to come do this. I hope I wasn't too long-winded. Oh, no. This is (laughs) wonderful. And, you know, hey. I am loving this series with you all. It has been absolutely wonderful. And if folks, if you aren't, um, if you haven't had the opportunity to see the first two, you can find it on the Onyx Strategies Group website. And you can also find it on YouTube uh, through LinkedIn. And so because this is the Onyx Strategies Group video blog, it's time for a shameless plug. At OSG, we build mission-critical partnerships, strategies, and boards. And so if you find that you need a little support with that, don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at onyxstrategiesgroup.com. It's been my sincere pleasure. Thank you, Brian, for coming on. This has been a wonderful way to wrap up the week. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. This is great. Thank you, Crystal. You're welcome.